Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Pastor Tim down at Hess Street Mission. And uh, it's good to be seen by you, hopefully. And uh, thank you for coming out. We'll spend a few moments here together and allow God to continue on in that journey He's doing in our life. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, we're glad that we could be here today, and we just ask that you by your spirit would meet with us. You know the prayers of our hearts. You know the things that we've been seeking after. We know the, you know the issues that we struggle with. But God, we just thank you for being a faithful God and walking with us. And you promised never to leave us. And so we expect, oh God, that wherever we go, whatever we do, you're there. Help us to hear your voice in those situations. Help us to be sensitive to the things that you want to do. That we might be used of you in the lives of other people. And that we might bring joy and glory and honor to your name. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to start with a song called I Call Out to You. Yeah, you probably don't know it, but uh, I'm going to sing. And if you learn it, you can sing along with us. semi-shut in, but things are happening and God's doing great things. 
Today I'm starting from Matthew chapter 5. It's kind of the beginning of Jesus' preaching ministry, and uh, it's, it's the uh, Beatitudes. I always, whenever I think of that word, it uh, kind of drives me crazy because it reminds me of a kid watching Romper Room. And I don't know why it is, except for the um, lady used to pick up the mirror and then she would, you know, say, I'm looking out there, who do I see today? And it was the doobie, right? A doobie, right? So you're supposed to do certain things. And so in Matthew 5, it says, And seeing the multitude, he went up into the mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now I want you to think about it. In Jesus' day, there would have been a people that would have been in an occupied uh, part of the world, and so they uh, probably weren't real happy in a lot of ways. They were under oppression. They were controlled by a foreign power. And so uh, good news probably wasn't super common. I know in the day-to-day -day life of things, you know, there was babies being born and weddings taking place and, and homes being bought and things like that. But there was this oppressive sense about the whole place. And so Jesus came and he came speaking to them a message that was different um, than what they were hearing from the scribes and the Pharisees. And so it starts off with this very um, general kind of exhortation from Jesus, a very general kind of, uh, uh, I'm speaking to you in general kind of exhortation. And he, he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now most of them would have felt that that certainly would apply to them. And so it was something that they would gravitate to. And blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And again, that would have been something that would have probably been something they could relate to. And as the, the message goes on, it's about Jesus speaking to the people words of comfort, but also words of truth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now that one might have come as a bit of a challenge to them, the idea of being meek. Because there was probably a tendency for many of them to be very angry and, and anger out of control. Blessed are those which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And blessed are the pure at heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so in that there would be some hopeful words being spoken to Jesus, but also some corrective type of words where he talks about them being um, merciful and meek. And then he gets into the whole idea about blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And that wouldn't have been a real common thread for most of them because they probably didn't feel like that. But in the whole presentation, Jesus is pre presenting a whole uh, perspective of what God is like and where God's blessing and where God's happiness flows. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he starts to make it more personal. And in verse 11 he says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. So in the general sense, we probably, like them, could all embrace the concepts up until this point, but now he's becoming very specific. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And so all the people are there, and Jesus is presenting this um, much more specific, much more directive, much more hopeful message than they've heard. You know, sometimes when we're presenting the message of God, we color it so much that although what we're saying is true, 
so much of our own personal temperament and, and anger and frustration comes through with the message that we're speaking. You know, our world is looking for truth today. They're looking for truth, but they're not looking for truth that is judgmental. They're not looking for truth that has your particular flavor on it. They're looking for truth that is embraceable by everyone. And then Jesus goes on, he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and, give, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And so sometimes we get uh, focused on, uh, you know, the Great Commission or um, giving or whatever the emphasis has been in our upbringing or our religious experience or whatever. And we, and we lose sight of the whole idea of living. And, and Jesus, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, as Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And sometimes in our frustration or our anxiety or our desire to try to do these things that we think are so important to God, we lose sight of the whole fact that we are important to God. We are the light of the world, and He wants to live out through us, and He wants us to be filled with joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength, right? Have you ever got to the point with things that you were either so frustrated or you were so, um, I don't know, overwhelmed with things that there was nothing left to do but to laugh and I don't mean laughing hysterically I just mean that you know you realize uh, you know that was the last of my money or that was the last of my efforts all that I could do and all that I have done has been done there's nothing I can do and then there is God right and so we laugh and we go well God I might I am totally dependent on you and, I, and that's where God wants us to spend a lot more of our time that the money he's given to us is money that he's given to us to use for the things that he wants to do. Yes, he wants to pay your bills. Yes, he wants to feed you and your children or your grandchildren. Yes, he wants to go. But he wants to, you to, to trust him with it. To, to know that he's a loving God who wants to meet your need. And that it's not about hoarding it. You know, the, the poverty mentality is to hang on to what you have rather than to give. The Bible says that God loveth the cheerful giver and we need to become cheerful in giving away things. What an opportunity it is. You know, the Bible says that God giveth good gifts to his children and every good and perfect gift comes from above. And God wants us to live that same way. He wants us to learn how to take things he's given to us and sometimes because he tells us to, to give them, but often because he wants us to, to have the same temperament. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, to be like him and so, just ministering to the needs of people. What does a smile cost? What does opening a door cost? What does giving someone a ride somewhere? In reality, it costs us nothing. And often, the return on the investment is immediate with the joy that we have from experiencing doing something that is pleasing to God. In Ephesians chapter 4, we have that passage that talks about the gifts. The ministry gifts. We're not going to get into the ministry gifts, regardless of where you are theologically with that point. But at the end of the, uh, or after the beginning of the list of the gifts, at the end of that, it says why they're given to us. And it says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, I'm reading Ephesians 4 and 12, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So God has given us all gifts. The, you know, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everybody. Everybody's part of it. Nobody's just a pew sitter. You know, I remember going to the church as a kid and everybody had their spot on the pew and most of the people were quite content. That's my job is to sit in this pew. And no, that isn't your job. Your job is to be used of God in whatever way. And, and, and more often than not, um, God has spoken to me through someone else who wasn't the pastor at the front but was the usher at the door or the greeter out on the parking lot, or the person who was taking out the garbage, who just loved God and wanted to be used of service, made service for Him. And often those are the people who have spoken the most into my life. 
And so it says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's what they're for. They're not so that you look important. It's not so that you look special. It's not so you, you can uh, be a one-man army. That's not what it's for. It's so that you can in invest what God has given to you into the lives of people that they might be built up and edified and God might be glorified in it. And it says, they're given, till we all come in the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's how long they're here for, until we come to that point. Okay? So, we need gifts, we need people to manifest them, we need preaching and teaching and all the things that are recorded in Scripture. And then it says, that we henceforth be no more children. You know, we're getting to that season of the year where we're all desirous to get out into our garden or the field or whatever and to begin that process of planting the seeds or, or pruning the plants or, or whatever, transferring or splitting some of the roots and bringing them around, whatever. And, and the whole growth thing is exciting for us. And so we're, we're kind of excited for that. But, but God as well has invested in us and he's looking for us to grow. The Bible talks about growing grace and in knowledge. But it says that we henceforth be no more children. You know, um, in families we have all kinds of people. We have newborn babies right up to the senior citizens. And so in your extended family you have all of that. Or maybe, maybe some at one end are dropping off and new ones are coming in at the other end. That's just the way it is. As we move through that uh, process of growth, we, we experience being a baby, being a toddler, being a, a tween, a teen... Uh, an adolescent, a uh, young adult, uh, middle-aged, old, whatever. And in all of that, there's a growth process. And, and we don't expect, or we ought not to expect, that the baby is at the same place that the adult is. And yet in the body of Christ, sometimes we have these expectations that uh, the newborn Christian needs to get his act together and start living up to what he, you know. And yet some of the rest of the people aren't. And, and not that we're supposed to be the fruit inspectors or uh, that, but sometimes we have that expectation um, several years ago, quite a few years ago now, we were up north with a friend and uh, the, we were able to dig up on our property, or, or I'm not exactly sure how the whole story starts, but we had dug up this little tiny chestnut tree. And we were excited because, you know, uh, chestnuts are, are great. Whether, they're, whether you just like them for the beauty of the little chestnuts or whether they're the edible kind you like them to eat at Christmas time or whatever, um, we, we had this little chestnut tree, and so we had this uh, little house in Dundas, well not a little house, but a house in Dundas, and we had a good sized backyard, and so way in the back where we had lots of room, we had planted this chestnut tree. And you know, the, the Bible says, by your fruit you shall know them, and so we were waiting for the manifestation of the chestnut tree's fruits to prove to us that he was in fact, or he was a chestnut tree, and we waited and waited, and it was a long time before we saw any visible manifestation, first flowers, and no chestnuts, and then later flowers and chestnuts. But you know, by the, from the time that we planted it, till the time that they manifested it was at least 15 years. And the reason I bring that up is sometimes we are really quick to have an expectation about fruit. Fruit is a, a developed thing. It's not a, a gift. It's not like a gift. You know, you might have the gift of music. You might have a gift of being able to present uh, ideas and concepts really well. Uh, you might have that gift and you, you, you have it. You've given it and you're good at it and you have it and you can manifest it right away. Uh, fruit isn't like that. Fruit takes time. Fruit takes seasons. Fruit takes a lot of things. And so this chestnut tree for many, many years did not manifest. And then we saw the fruit of what we had already known by other things. That it was indeed a chestnut tree. And so in the early phases of people's Christian life, they have a testimony, which is this is what happened in my life. And that's all they usually have. And there's... Uh, and fruit is going to be a process of development. And that's why it's important that we all manifest what God's given to us as a gift in the body of Christ. That we, we sow into the members of the body together. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in, into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now it's interesting, it says, but speaking the truth in love. 
And so often we speak the truth in frustration, or in anger, or in obligation. But it's a whole different thing to speak the truth in love. And I've often thought as I've pondered on that particular verse that, that love without truth isn't really love. Right? And truth without love isn't really truth. And so we're exhorted to speak the truth in love. Make sure that the motivation of why you're speaking something is love. Speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him in all things which is the head of in Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make an increase of the body onto the edifying of itself in love. You know, sometimes we, we hang around uh, our group and we wonder why nothing changes. Nothing. You know what? Sometimes... Sometimes I have to, sometimes you have to, sometimes somebody else has to be the person who says, you know what, we've been at this stage a long time. I need to press on in speaking the truth in love, in demonstrating my gift, in being tolerant, and being an example, and being all of those things. In Numbers chapter 20, verse 1, we have this, this story about Moses. And it said, Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin, in the first month, and the people abode at Kadesh, and Miriam died there, and was buried there. Now Miriam, of course, is Moses' sister. Um, Moses and Aaron and Miriam were siblings. And it says, And there was no water for their congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Now, I don't know about you, but it, it, if I was Moses, you, you got to wonder, how long is this going to continue? How many times can we go over this? How many times do we have to uh, go through this uh, doubt, faith, miraculous doubt thing on. And it says in verse 3 of uh, Numbers chapter 20, And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have you made us to come out of Egypt, to bring us in, into this evil place? It is no place of seed, or of fig, or of vines, or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. Now that's, that's a great part. I mean, and, and how often do we react without doing that? But that was the right thing, to go and, and God, what are we going to do? God, what are we going to do? God, you brought us here. And in verse 7 it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak you unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord, as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, you rebels, must we fetch your water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with the rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because you believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. Now it's a great story, but what's great about it is it shows us the importance of, of allowing our perspective to affect how we relate to the people of God or the people of the world. You know, every time um, we're out in the world and we're exposed to people, sometimes we they aggravate you. I don't know. You ever been aggravated by people? Hello. I, I, you know, as a kid, I always liked that ver verse, and it says, "Provoking one another unto love." Okay. And it's funny because I knew how to provoke my sisters unto anger. It was a whole different thing to learn how to provoke anybody unto love, and yet we we have within us. 
an understanding of how to push people's buttons. And somehow, for some reason, we, we enjoy pushing the wrong buttons because we love to get the reaction. And God's saying to us, I want you to start learning how to provoke people unto love, even when they despitefully use you. Remember back in Matthew, he was talking about that? Even when they say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. See, God wants us to grow. And we're often very judgmental of everybody else about where they are. Oh, yeah, yeah, he says he's a Christian, but look at him over there. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what about us? And you see, just like that Matthew 5, when he was speaking, Jesus was speaking to the people. He talked to them in very, very gentle, very general terms. And then he brought them to some very profound truths that he wanted them to understand about what it was like to have the character and nature of God. And that if they were truly going to be happy, if they were truly going to be blessed, if they were truly going to accomplish something, there had to be a transformation in them. And yet he knew that many of them were never going to change. He knew that some of them probably were the people that not many years down the road were going to call for his crucifixion. But yet he still, in love, spoke the truth. And so Moses, in his frustration with the people, instead of presenting what God had said and demonstrating it in the way that God had asked him to, he allowed his anger to come forth. Because you believe me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation to the land which I have given them. Think about that. We often think about how great it would be to be someone like Moses. Wow, you know, look at how he, he was the leader. He, you know, yeah. And this is what happens when you're the leader sometimes, is that we get carried away in our own feelings. We get caught up in our own frustrations. Remember, they're not our people. They're God's people. I remember over the years as pastoring that uh, sometimes people would come to me and say, Pastor Tim, I don't think your kids behave very much like the kids of a pastor. I always like that because I'm not sure what the kids of the pastor are supposed to behave like. Um, my answer was always the same. I said, yes, and look out at the world and see how the, the children of God behave. I wasn't justifying their actions. I was just the reality of the fact that it, there has to be a transformation on the inside. There has to be a transformation on the inside. There has to be a desire about hungering and thirsting after righteousness. If you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, you'll be filled because as you seek God, as His Word comes into your life and you desire to do it, you'll start to do those things because you'll recognize that this is the nature and character of God. Paul writes and he says that I might know Him. That I might know Him. Do you want to know God? Really know God? Not superficially know God. Not the story of the crucifixion of Jesus or the story of the creation of the world, but to really know God. And Paul goes on and he says that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. That's the exciting part, isn't it, right? Wow, the power. And sometimes we get obsessed with that. You know what? I'll, I'll say this now and I'll say it again. God is an amazing God who can do anything. Even today he can heal the sick and raise the dead. That's not a problem for God. But when we try to make it happen so that we look great, or that we look wonderful, that we look like we're the hand of God, it is displeasing to God as it is when Moses struck the rock. When we're trying to put on a show, it's the same thing. It misrepresents God to the people. God doesn't need you to do it. God just wants you to be available so He can do it. Okay? God doesn't need me to speak. God chooses to use me to speak, and if I will be faithful with it, God will honor it. Yes, God is able to do anything. Absolutely anything. All we have to do is seek His face. All we have to do is provide an opportunity for Him. All we have to do is be available to follow the lead of His Spirit. To understand the written Word and hide it in our hearts. Allow it to become part of us. Right? And I will wrap it around my heart. I will wrap it around my neck. The truths of God. 
right? And so because of this action, Moses and Aaron didn't get to go into the promised land. Now that didn't end the thing that God wanted to do. The children of Israel still went in. You know, there's always somebody God has ready. You know, I remember Elijah. Elijah up there on the mountain complaining, I'm the only one, I'm the only one. And you know what God tells him to do when he leaves there? When he finally comes down to hearing the voice of God in a still small voice, when he comes to the realization that there are lots of people that are still following God, God sends him from there to anoint the new king and to anoint his replacement. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. God wants to do an amazing thing in us. But let's be careful that as we're out ministering to people, we don't allow our personal feelings. You know, that's why the Lord's Prayer talks about that. That, that God forgives us as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's all connected together. How, how dare I or how dare you hold things against other people when God in His greatness, God in His perfection has been willing to forgive you? It doesn't mean it's not hard to forgive. It doesn't mean it's not a challenge when dealing with people. It just means that we have to come back to God and say, God, I recognize I need to do it the way you want me to do it. So let's trust God. Let's allow Him to do something great in our life. I'm going to close in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank You for allowing us to gather today. And God, we, we appreciate the fact that You have uh, created opportunities for us and given us time and given us Your grace and extended and extended and extended for us, that we might truly allow you to do your work in us. That we start to let go of the idea that I'm super special, and, and but rather to recognize that God is an amazing God. And he, even when Moses fails, he is faithful. Even when Pastor Tim fails, he is faithful. And so God, we, we thank you for that. And as we start a new week, a new, new exciting week, we say, God, be with me in this week. Teach me new things. Show me more about how wondrous you are. Lead me to be transformed more into your image. Show me how to impact people in this world for you and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, maybe one more song. What do you think? When you found me, I was drowning out. Broke the law, but you found me out. I was just looking for something. Just I knew that you understood, so I gave it all away for you. Walk me in your arms, hold me close. Jesus, I love you, yes I do. Walk me in your arms, hold me Everybody's waiting for the bombs to fall They look to me and I smile instead They all think that I've lost my head I just look to heaven and I say Walk me in your arms Hold me close Jesus Thank you.
soon.